Good evening, everyone. We're going to start tonight's Bible class with a question, and we're going to look at Matthew chapter 13. Uh, verse 13, is that what you're talking about, brother? Say nod, nod your head, yes, I'll see you. No, I don't really see you, but Matthew 13, verse 13. Wonderful question, wonderful statement, wonderful everything. This is not about the whole household of God. It is about a third of it, or about one third uh, factor in it. Uh, he starts this off in chapter 3 with the parable of the sower. It says, he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. That starts the beginning of the 14 parables that the Lord speaks in the book of Matthew. And when you get down to verse 11, or verse 10 rather, the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Now that was the crowd. The word them is a reference to the crowd. And he spoke to the to the disciples in parables because then he took the disciples privately and explained the parables to them. Look at verse 12. For whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that, that he hath. And that is a picture of the kingdom of heaven, not a picture of uh, either uh, the dispensation of grace and the body of Christ, nor is, it a, nor is that a picture of the uh, Israel in the land. It's a picture of the, of the kingdom of heaven. Remember he said the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are going to be known by the disciples in the previous verse, in verse 11. Now verse 13, therefore speak out of them in parables because they see, see not, and hearing they hear, and, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. This is the fulfillment of prophecy that is, it is repeated three times after it was prophesied. First prophesied in Isaiah chapter 6, and three more times the passage is used to make the people of Israel to know what they are guilty of, so to speak, in not believing him. Now, I don't know where else to go with that, but I can tell you that this brings about from here uh, through uh, Matthew 26, I believe it is, the, uh, the, the ten uh, uh, virgins and the oil, the five were wise and five were foolish, uh, that's the last of the parables. And all these parables are just about the uh, referencing into the kingdom of heaven. You'll find, like, for instance, when he gets down to verse 24, he says, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto and the, uh, the parables, as they're given, the kingdom of heaven uh, is likened unto, uh, is the word uh, uh, several different times, as in verse uh, 31. Another, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. Or verse 33, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven and on and on. I mean, every one of this is, uh, these things are about the kingdom of heaven. So that's a very specific portion of this, the whole household of God that we see on the board here. We have the whole household of God being the land which Israel was promised from Abraham forward. The Jews were promised, rather, from Abraham forward. Israel being the recipient of it. David being their king in the future. The uh, city, which has the 12 apostles' names on the doors, or on the uh, uh, judgment post and the 12 uh, tribes of Israel's names on the doors are 12 apostles as kings and 144,000 Jews as priests. And then the uh, place far above all heavens, here being the starry heaven, here's up here where we are. That's the church, the body of Christ. And together that makes up the whole household of God, the kingdom of heaven just being one portion of it. So I hope that helps, Brother Rodney. We'll take that up again later. You guys can turn now to back to where we were in Ephesians, chapter 3, and we'll start over there. In Ephesians 3, I appreciate you all being here tonight. By the way, the conference was a very great blessing to hear the preachers preach and uh, uh, some really great lessons taught. You can get catch one or two of those on audio, I think, um, 
uh, on Facebook, but uh, generally speaking, those, those messages were not recorded. But there was a man there that, uh, Kevin Sharp, uh, his name, if you want to look up Kevin Sharp's uh, Facebook page, I think he had, I don't know whether he had two or three preachers on there, but he did uh, record some of it. But um, all in all, the, um, the preaching was great. The fellowship was great. It was probably the biggest crowd we've had in, in uh, Gatlinburg yet. I don't know how many it was. Probably, I'm guessing, 135, something like that, maybe 140. But a really, really great uh, turnout, and uh, it was a great blessing to be there. I really appreciate it. And by the way, while we're talking about that, Brother Sam Gerhardt's uh, mother died um, during the conference. He, he got... Uh, the word that his mother had passed away in Oklahoma and before the conference was over they had set the uh, memorial service for next Saturday and uh, he'll be going out there and in fact is, has the honor of, of uh, speaking preaching at his uh, mother's funeral and uh, my brother Jack and I did that at our mother's funeral I, I praise the Lord for that praise the Lord for the opportunity to do that and um, uh, you know, when there's a good testimony of salvation, it's a wonderful thing to get to to get to speak it and speak on the behalf of the one that's deceased. And uh, Brother Sam's looking forward to doing that. And uh, Barb and I'll be going back up there this coming week. He asked me to take his place at his church next Sunday. So pray for us and uh, pray for Brother Sam Gerhardt going out to uh, somewhere near Tulsa, I believe it is, in Oklahoma. All right, Ephesians chapter uh, 3, I want you to start reading with me in verse 1, and then we'll quickly go through some verses here. Paul writes, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, now the few words, there's a comma there, so he, it's in a parenthesis, and there is a comma, and by the way, it is after a semicolon. The parenthesis starts after a semicolon, which means, semicolon means there's more than one explanation note to follow. The parenthesis means if you don't get what's in the parenthesis, you'll miss the point of the semicolon in this case. Now, he said, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery semicolon uh, paragraph, or uh, um, uh, parentheses, as I wrote a four in few words. The only place this mystery had been spoken of is in the few words of chapter one and chapter two. Can you say that again? He's, he's talking about the mystery, which he is going to explain in more detail by the semicolon, but the parenthesis says, as I wrote a four in few words. Well, this mystery which he is explaining concerning the dispensation of the grace of God is about the things he has explained in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And let me tell you the really great news. That's us. That is us. He's explained about us. He has made a place in God's plan here. Paul has put together the place where we can see us. We are, as in verse chapter 2, verse 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Who's the you? Oh, that would be chapter 1, verse 13. Verse 12 of chapter 1 says that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And based upon the gospel being delivered unto Paul, he said, for I delivered unto you that which I also received in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, and so that gospel was delivered unto Paul, and he delivered it to some people, and he refers to himself in verse 12 here by saying we, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, and that would be Paul, and whoever else is in this first group, let's see. During the time frame of the book of Acts, up to about Acts chapter 20, he wrote to the Thessalonians, and he was in about five other churches in their general area. There was Thessalonica, there was Berea, there was Amphipolis, Apollonia, uh, maybe, maybe one more. And, uh, and then there was also the Corinth, because he wrote the Corinthian letters during that time. And so he went down to Corinth, and he left there, and he went back and wrote to them back again. And then he also, before he went away to Jerusalem, he also wrote to the Romans. And 
initially he wrote to the 10 or 11 Galatian churches, the churches of Galatia he referred to. So I now can see by looking at those first books, who are those, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, then that's the people Paul first went to, where he went to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. Here, in verse 13, he adds these people. Verse 13, in whom, in Christ, in whom ye, these Ephesians, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, uh, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now that's the ones that he is explaining in chapter 3, how come this mystery got to them? which he describes these same people in chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Notice again verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Think about that verse. Are you saved? If that's the case, when were you quickened together with Christ. When was Christ quickened? He was quickened three days and three nights after he was crucified. Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised again the third day, quickened. And looky there in chapter 2, verse 5, who was quickened with him? Me. You. All of us in the church, the body of Christ, of which there was no such thing until the Apostle Paul was given the mystery of it. So here we are in the mystery of the dispensation of grace, having received the grace and being placed into the body of Christ. Look, look back in chapter 1 again. The mighty power of God is mentioned in verse 19. It has to do with resurrection power. We talked about that a lot last week. Now verse 20 which he, God Almighty, wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Now watch, and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. Are you in the body? Well, then you are part of the fullness of the Lord Give it over unto the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to fill all things. Look in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 9. Now that, he, now that he ascended, the one who ascended is Jesus Christ. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Well, if the body of Christ is that which fill us, fill, filleth all in all, and Christ is going to fill all things, then how is he going to do it? He's going to do it with his body. Now we're back to chapter 2 again, and we're seeing how that came about. Suddenly it came about. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, by grace you're saved. You see, there's no time element for Christ and the body of Christ. We're the ones, <laughs> put this as kindly as possible, we're the ones stuck here in this time frame. Verse, look, look at the parentheses there, it's in a parenthesis, it says, by grace you are saved. Now notice verse 5, or 6 rather. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are you besides sitting in your living room or in your easy chair or whatever watching this video? Where are you? Well, you are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. How do you know that? Because it's been done since he quickened. When Christ was quickened, you were quickened. Well, then how long since the Lord knew you? Well, according to chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it was from before the foundation of the world. When did you become a part of it when you trusted Christ as your Savior? How did that come about? 
Christ died for your sins. Did you, the night or day or morning or whatever it was that you got saved, did you just purge away all that sin? You didn't purge nothing. If you really got saved, it's because you gave up depending upon yourself to do something about your <clears throat> naughtiness. And you put your trust in the one who could save you, which is Jesus Christ. If you didn't put your trust in Jesus Christ, why would you think you're saved? Because you're good? I think you know better than that. You're honest with yourself. You know quite well you're not any good. We all know exactly what we are when we get in the dark. We all know what we are when our thoughts are the only ones there. So we needn't be pumps. We needn't act like we did it. We didn't do it. And if you think you did something to get yourself saved, maybe you ought to rethink whether or not you're saved. Because it has to do with, according to chapter 1, verse 13, hearing the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believing it and trusting Christ for salvation. Now we're ready to go back to chapter 3. He says, as I wrote a form, few words, and that's why all we went back over there in verse 3. Now verse 4. Whereby when you read, when you go back and read chapter 1 and chapter 2, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, I want to do this on this part of the board over here where I've got a bigger spot. But here's Paul getting saved in Acts chapter 9. He heard the gospel of Christ. He heard the words. Oops. Ah, I'll be all right. Just give me a minute. Paul heard the words which he repeated in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Four were not written until some time later. But Paul heard how that Christ died for his sins, was buried, and was raised for his justification by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He said, the gospel which I preached was not received of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he heard this gospel. He was saved. He could not get saved by the gospel of the kingdom. He was a blasphemer. But he was saved by the grace of God uh, because of the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. So he was saved. So Paul was the first, according to 1 Timothy 1, 16, he was the first one saved into the body of Christ. The body of Christ on this earth began here with Paul. And it's still going on today. The body of Christ is the church, which is called his body. He is the head of the church, which is his body, and on and on. Now, all of that being true, when did the mystery of Christ come into the mind of men? Acts chapter 9. How much knowledge did Paul have in the mystery of Christ? Well, he had all there was because it was given to him by revelation. The mystery of Christ is how that Christ died for our sins was buried and was raised for our justice. In other words, as in, in Romans 16, 25, now to him that's a power to, I'm going to foul that up. The mind is a strange thing, isn't it? Probably quoted that 49,311 times. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel, he calls it three times my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, that would be the mystery of Christ, obviously, uh, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. So from way back here in the, in the beginning, this part, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, which started the body of Christ, was kept secret since the world began, but revealed to the Apostle Paul. So how much knowledge did he have in the mystery of Christ? All there was to get. As he said in, in Galatians 1, the Lord revealed it to him. And when there was a dispute with people from Jerusalem, the Lord revealed to him that he should go up to Jerusalem and tell them that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. So the body of Christ is formed by the mystery of Christ. Now, go back in this word one more time here. Verse 3. 
how that by revelation he, Jesus Christ, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now watch, as I wrote a for a few words, whereby when you read, when you read about the mystery, which he wrote in chapter 1 and chapter 2, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What did Paul know from here forward? He knew that the Lord God Almighty would save anyone that believed. How do you know that? You know that by Acts 13, verse 38 and 39. Now, when he said it, he said, all that believe are justified from all things when you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. He was talking to men in a synagogue who were both Jews and Gentiles that feared God. Whosoever among you feareth God is how its terminology is. So he was talking to Jews and Gentiles, and what he said was, all which believe. So here's Paul's understanding of the gospel of Christ as he spelled it out in Acts 13, 38, and 39. But he didn't go to all. He went to Jew first, also to the Gentile. But when he writes the book of Ephesians, it is after the end of the book of Acts in which he pronounced the thing in Acts chapter 28. Turn there, Acts chapter 28. In Acts chapter 28, verse 17, Paul is sitting in prison, but he's a Roman citizen, so he has certain freedoms. Verse 17, and it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. So he called the Jews which were in Rome over to his prison house and talked with them there. Look at verse 20. He says to them, for this cause, therefore, have I, Paul, called for you, Jews, to see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel, I'm bound with this chain. The hope of Israel in general was resurrection. The hope of Israel by the time Paul is talking to them about resurrection is the gospel of Christ. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, buried again, buried was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. Still, resurrection. Now notice, he says, because that for the hope of Israel, I'm bound with this chain. And time goes on, and they wound up not believing him. Now look, if you will, in verse uh, 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word. Here's Paul quoting the verse out of Isaiah 6. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. Notice who they, who closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. The people wouldn't have anything of it. These guys won't either. And this does it. This is the end of it. There is no more reference anywhere in your Bible, time-wise, there is no more reference to anyone ever going to a Jew separately ever again like Paul just did here. Look at the next verse. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Well, ultimately, that word of salvation is sent to these Ephesians. And we're reading about it right now in Ephesians chapter 3. Paul knew the mystery of Christ would reach all the way to anyone who heard it. He didn't go to this kind of Gentile ever. The Lord told him back in chapter, Acts chapter 23, about halfway between these two places, the Lord told him that, that he was going to send him, his ministry, far hence unto the Gentiles. That'd be these guys and you and me. The far hence people include us. We were never close to Israel. We never had Israelites to go depend upon for something. There, in our lifetimes, especially, there never has been an Israelite you could depend upon. 
Now, I, I don't mean about that bad character. I mean about the things of the Lord. Now, here's the thing. Paul knew the word had to go to the Jew first. You know that by scripture, which he wrote. But he also knows when he says these words in Acts chapter 28, that's the end of it. Well, he didn't go anywhere else to preach. He was in prison. And if he did get out of prison, it looks like he did get out of prison, for, but it was for a very short period of time. Then he went back into prison, and the second time he went into prison, he got killed. Now, how did this word get to these Gentiles? These last seven letters that Paul wrote. Now, back, go back to Ephesians and look at Ephesians 3 in that parenthesis one more time. In Ephesians 3, Verse, it, concerning the dispensation of the grace of God in verse 2, now in verse 3, how that by revelation he, Jesus Christ, made known unto me the mystery. That would be the mystery of the dispensation of the grace of God. Then he says, whereby, as I wrote afore in few words, chapter 1 and chapter 2, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, if you'll think about what he knew back here when he got saved, what he knew when he preached here in Acts 13, 38, and 39, and said, all what he knew here in Acts chapter 28 when he said the word of this salvation is sent unto the Gentiles, then he knew that the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation, would save anyone. And so it does. And so it still does. And so this mystery that you could take it to anyone was revealed by the words he spoke and explained in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Say, so, well, why wasn't it spoken of before? When you get there, you can ask him why it wasn't spoken there. I'm going to give you a really good reason in a moment. But you can ask him when you, when you get there. Or for that matter, you can ask the Lord. He'll tell you. There's going to be some, by the way, there's going to be some grace believers surprised at that answer. But I, throw, I, I, I may be one of them. Anyway, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4. Um, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 6, here it is. That the Gentiles, that's not just that you Gentiles, it's the Gentiles. Who is that? Everybody. It's not everybody that's non-Jewish. There are no more Jews being dealt with. There's no Jews being dealt with at all in the book of Ephesians or Colossians. He says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. We're all in the same. We're all in the same body. There was Jews and Gentiles in Acts 9, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. The Jews and Gentiles both. After Acts chapter 28, no one's called a Jew anymore. In the body of Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. So how did, this, how did this terminology come to be Gentiles? The Gentiles means everybody in all the nations. That's what that terminology would mean. The word the is a definite article. The word Gentiles is of the nations. All who are of the nations. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his, that's God's promise in Christ, watch, by the gospel. Not by being an heir according to Abraham, not be, by being a Jew by birth or by association or by proselytizing. Anybody, everybody, anywhere, everywhere, by the gospel. We don't separate people out into categories when we preach the gospel to them, do we? If you ever known anyone who did that, tell them to stop it. You know, um, it doesn't matter whether you're talking to a, 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 a bum, a drunk, a lady of the evening, or a preacher. By the way, I've... I, I, I've told this many times, but I just love to ask preachers if they're saved, and 
would they please give me their testimony? And I found out years ago, it was probably more fun to ask a Methodist preacher that than it was anyone else. Now, if, I, if there's some Methodist preacher in the, in the uh, uh, audience here, in this worldwide web audience we've got, there's a Methodist preacher in the bunch, please write me and give me your testimony of when you got saved. And by the way, I'm not saying Methodist preachers aren't saved. I'm just saying that the bulk of them, they don't like it when you ask them. Many of you have heard the story, but I once had three legs of a, of a four-leg air, airplane journey. On three of those legs, I sat down next to a man who turned out to be a Methodist preacher. So I asked all three of them, are you saved? Tell me your testimony. Two of them got angry. And one of them just absolutely clammed up and wouldn't talk to me anymore. The other one wanted to argue with me about whether or not it was any of my business, <laughs> which, I, which I was just thrilled to get to argue with him. But the third one, he said, yes, I am saved. And by the way, you're one of the few people that has ever asked me if I'm saved. He said, the last one to ask me that was a, was a, a college freshman, a teenage boy. And he said, uh, I can tell you, I got saved when I was a senior in college, and I went to seminary and found out not very many people in that seminary were saved and he said but there are some of us in the Methodist church that are saved and and uh, we like to tell people our testimonies I said well praise the Lord he said we're trying to win back the denomination for Christ and I said I have really good news for you Christ isn't interested in your denomination he says I know he didn't he doesn't need the denomination but he said I know the denomination needs salvation I said preach on brother get on with it I don't know where he's at or what he's doing but I believe he had a testimony of salvation. The other two, I did not believe they had a testimony. Why would you not tell somebody your testimony? Say, well, it's none of their business. It's everybody's business. Your testimony is the most powerful words you carry. Anyway, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of God's promise in Christ by the gospel. That's the key, the gospel. And that's why, hopefully, you don't hear grace preachers get up and preach without them preaching the gospel. They should preach the gospel every time they stand up. We don't know who's saved and who's lost. We don't even know who's listening. You know, uh, I've told two or three stories about this and had other people experience the same thing. You're talking to someone about the gospel of Christ, and they're arguing with you, or they're trying to understand it, or they're trying to wrap their head around it, or they're afraid to give up, and they're holding out. What? And all of a sudden, somebody off to the side who's been listening gets saved. You don't know who's listening. So I was just talking to this lady who's sitting behind you, who's sitting in front of you, who's sitting beside her, on and on it goes. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. That's what it's about. You don't, how would you pick the season? You just tell everybody the gospel. Tell them your story. Your story is wonderful if you have a testimony of salvation somewhere in it. Because the moment of salvation for us is all exactly the same. But how we get there, on which road we get there, and how we come to that point, all of us are uniquely different. Practice your testimony. The moment you got saved, that never changes. But how you got to that moment, get your story straight. And you'll be a blessing to people when you tell that. You really will. Even people who don't want to hear it won't forget it. It's part of the revelation of this mystery. The Gentiles could get saved. And you and I, we don't know who they are. I believe, and not everyone believes this, but I believe that the body of Christ in total is a specific number. Some people believe it's amount of time. Okay, I don't care. I just believe it's a specific number. We don't know when the last one's going to get saved. And we don't know whether the last one is going to be a guy who's been preaching in a church for 48 years or a guy who's never heard it before or one that's been going to grace gospel uh, uh, meetings and, and Bible classes for 32 years and finally gives up and trusts Christ as Savior. We don't know who's going to get saved next. We just know they can they should trust Christ as their Savior. So that's what that mystery is all about. Anybody can get saved. Anybody, anywhere, 
nearby or far off. I'll send you far hence unto the Gentiles, the Lord told, told Paul. So he sends him far hence over to Rome, puts him in prison, and Paul writes it to the Gentiles. Is that something? The answer to that is yes, that's really something. Now, back in Ephesians chapter 3. Now, last week we, uh, we concentrated somewhat on the prayer, which is in the last part of this chapter. And we had already gone over some things between chapter 3, verse 6, and chapter 3, verse uh, 11. But I want to go over one or two more things, to maybe a little differently. Notice in verse 6 again, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, and created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. Now, I want... I want to go over something with you. When Paul said that he was going, that he it was given unto him to preach these unsearchable riches, he was going to, he was given to him to preach the unsearchable riches. Now the deal is this: Paul knew this for a while. I don't know what he knew from the beginning about this, but I know that he he did know about these unsearchable riches for quite a while if you'll turn back in your bible to second corinthians chapter 12 second corinthians chapter 12 in second corinthians chapter 12 and this probably uh it was written it looks like this was written at the start of acts chapter 20 maybe verse 3 and 4 but notice he mentions a thing here in verse 2 that happened previously, 14 years previous. I would suggest to you that probably this happened in Acts chapter 14, when he was stoned and left for dead and carried out of the city as though he were dead. Notice chapter, chapter 12, verse two. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard, watch, unspeakable words. And I'm going to say, for sake of argument, might cause one, that it was right there. So he's writing this in Acts chapter 20, and that's 14 years later. He's writing 2 Corinthians. I'll just put a to Corinthians right there. And that's, that's when he wrote, in Acts chapter 20, when he wrote those words, I knew a man in Christ, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. However, he also doesn't tell us the words. Keep reading. Verse 4, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, Yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, well, what's he, where is his desire to glory? It's the unspeakable words that he heard when he was caught up into paradise. The man he was when he was there is what he could glory in. Of such an one will I glory. But notice, he says in verse 6, for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. Then there is some truth coming out of this that he is not going to say yet. Watch. But now I forbear, which means put off. I, I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me. Now watch this verse. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. 
Now that word is just exactly what it sounds like. Abundance. You know what abundance is. Abundance is more than you need. It's more than you expected. It's more than you can wrap your head around. Abundance, the uh, uh, abundance of the revelation. Revelations, I think it is, isn't that plural? Through the abundance of the revelations. So he says in verse 7, watch carefully, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Well, twice he says, lest I should be exalted above measure, and that's th those two phrases are wrapped around an abundance of the revelations. And he promised in the previous verse now, I will say the truth, but now I forbear. Okay, so there is somewhere out there, there is an abundance of revelations that he is going to say. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says to Timothy in verse 5, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. By the way, this is the last words that Paul wrote. This is the last chapter of the last book that Paul wrote, verse 5. But watch thou in all things, in dear afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Did you see that? He said, I have finished my course. When did he give out the abundance of the revelations? He gave the abundance of the revelations in everything that was written after 2 Corinthians. What was written after 2 Corinthians? Philippians was. Colossians was. Philemon was. First and 2 Timothy was. One, two, three, four, five. Titus was. And Ephesians was. Huh. Where's the abundance of revelations? Right there. Those seven books are the abundance of the revelations that he could not speak in 2 Corinthians 12. How do I know? Because he said, I will say the truth, but now I forbear. And 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 said he had finished his course. The abundance of the revelations is about how the Lord gave us all that he had ever given to anyone else in the person of Jesus Christ. It is the, it is the grace dispensation, and it is for the body of Christ. The body of Christ in the grace dispensation of course, we needed the first six books, uh, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Thessalonian letters. We needed that. If we didn't have that, we could not lay it, that foundation of the, of the gospel of Christ. We could not perform um, the things which are wrapped around the gospel of Christ if we didn't have these six books. We've got instruction back there beyond belief. But this is us with this. Now, folks, to me, this is all very simple. It takes all 13 books that Paul wrote, right there, for the church, the body of Christ, to exist and to have existed since Paul was saved. But he did not speak all that he knew and much of it was a mystery, referred to as the mystery of the gospel. Not the mystery of Christ, that is the gospel. But the mystery of the gospel is that you and I can get it. 
So how'd that come about? The revelation of this abundant good news. And he couldn't write it until the Lord said he could. And he couldn't write it to just this first group. He wrote it to all of us. And it is abundant in its revelations. Far above all heavens? Nobody ever heard of a thing like that. All the world becoming Gentiles again, just like they were prior to Abraham. People ignore that. It doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, how tall you are, how fat you are. It doesn't matter how stupid you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It matters whether or not you will humble yourself before the mighty God and trust in Jesus Christ's work and that alone to receive salvation. And you're not placed into Israel in the land. You're not placed into the city coming down from God out of heaven. You are placed into the body of Christ, which is far above all heavens and cannot be denied that which belongs to it. Hmm. Back in second, back in Ephesians chapter three. Verse nine. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. It does not say to make all men see the mystery. It's to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And if you see the fellowship of the mystery, it's because you're going to see that you and me are just alike. If you hear me doing some scallywag thing and you want to condemn me, you go right ahead. It won't make any difference. God Almighty has not condemned me. As a matter of fact, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And guess what? That's not in the last seven books. That's right over here. And God is not mad at me. He's not mad at you. You say, yeah, but I caught you. Big deal. So you shouldn't have done it. Well, you're right about that. I could name you a few dozen other things I shouldn't have done. I know you find that hard to believe. But then again, if I found that out about you, I'd say, yeah, well, we're just about alike. That's because we are. We're all just alike. None of us got anything over anybody else. Praise the Lord. Now, here's the deal. When we make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, then we have fellowship with them. We really do. Not only that, it says that God had an intention. It, God's intention was to use us. Here it is. In verse 10, to the intent that now, now, after Paul wrote these words, when the revelation of the mystery was known, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Oh, that's all these guys up here in red. They're out there. Now. Paul said, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with those guys in Ephesians chapter 6. Now look, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Who are we, the church? You and me, people with the testimony of salvation, preachers up and down the highways, if they've got a testimony of salvation. Heard from a dear brother, pastor of a church up here in the countryside, and he said that, uh, he, he's been preaching the grace message there for about three years now. And he said, I think he said either four people in three weeks or three people in four weeks that thought they were saved and finally came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by putting their trust in the finished work that Jesus Christ offered for them. Praise God for that. And it says here <clears throat> that we, the church, are making this heavenly place position known to all those guys in so-called heavenly places when we're the ones we're in heavenly places 
seated together with Christ, far above all heavens. Ain't that something? Yes, it is. Now notice, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Does that make us look good? Oh, no. It makes the wisdom of God to be known. Manifold means spread out and pushed out. Manifold. It goes out. The wisdom of God. How does it show the wisdom of God to save a dumb old hick like me? It shows that God's wisdom and God's glory and God's power is above it all. And he can redeem those willing to believe. He can redeem you. All you have to do is to trust what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary. Christ died for you. He went to hell for you. God raised him from there. He left your sins. The sins are gone. Death, hell, and the grave are gone. Same people don't die. They go to sleep. Well, the difference between that and dying. Well, the flesh dies. Yeah, you're not taking your flesh to heaven with you anyway. Even if you're here when the Lord comes back, he's going to change you like that. Neither here nor there. So I want the rapture. Me too. Tonight. But now, here's the deal. Why does he do this? Why does he have this whole household of God built up here? Why does he have all of us up here with Christ? Very next verse. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose, which he, God Almighty, purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why did Christ do all of this? Why did he come here and live a life perfect and sinless and then give himself up as a perfect sacrifice for all of us? Why did God raise him from the dead? Why did God seat him at his own right hand? Why did God call us into that position as well as in Ephesians 2? Verse 5, 6, and 7. Why did he do that? Because of the eternal purpose which God has purposed in Christ Jesus. The eternal purpose of God, found in about three verses, is to destroy the works of the devil, Satan, Lucifer, that dude. So, well, why is this taking so long? It's taking God long at all. We're the ones in time. So who are we in time? Look back in chapter 1. And then I will shut up here. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, we've just been talking about it, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, watch this now, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, fullness of times, and he's talking about time here, multiple that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We've been talking about that inheritance, right? We have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God Almighty knew exactly what he was doing, when in time, he counted time from the evening and the morning or the first day, he counted time from when uh, Noah uh, and, the, and the preaching of Noah and the flood of Noah came, Abraham, <clears throat> and the time frame that God Almighty gave Abraham about how long his people were going to be in bondage and so forth, the time frame that he gave the judges from the law, the time frame of David and the kings, the time frame of Jesus Christ, the time frame which took uh, till A.D. 70 until Israel was totally set aside and the time frame over here in the future of the seven years and the thousand year reign of Christ before there is a new heaven and a new earth, what time is left? This time where you and I are and it's called the fullness of time. Why? Because it fills up the timeline. This is all recorded history. This is all pre-recorded history. How about you and me? We don't know how long it's going to take. Would it bother you if it took another thousand years? Wouldn't me. I thank you for being here tonight. I hope this has been a blessing, and I hope that there's a, a way that you can see something out of it. I want to thank you for that. I'm going to turn this off now because my red light came on and because you're all tired. So good night, everybody.